Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Tom Haig. I'm a Murrow graduate from uh, 2009. First of all, I want to thank uh, Corey and Carrie uh, for putting this stuff together. And a big shout out to Connelly Roden, who was my classmate from the class of 2009. And I believe is still hanging around the uh, Pullman campus, raising four Green Bay Packer fans, which, you know, the Godspeed to the men. So um, the title of the product of this presentation is Gorilla Video Production in Disability Communities in Low Resource Countries. That's a lot to unload. Um, so it, uh, we'll go through this. Uh, it's about 40 years in developing uh, what, the, you know, the final product is in, in, uh, in what I do. Um, I'm going to have to go through a little bit of a Grandpa Simpsoning to show you uh, how, this, how my mentality to make this product got going. And, uh, and uh, hopefully you guys being journalists will have some questions along the way. If you look at this picture right there, this is uh, taken in Dharamsala, India. This is my first attempt at doing what I'm calling guerrilla journalism, which just means like you just go without waiting for people to like uh, come up with uh, some institutionalized way for you to go and do stuff. You just go, you find equipment, you go, you shoot it. I had the idea in my head to do this. The opportunity came up, so I went. So this is in the Himalayas, the Dharamsala is where the Dalai Lama lives. Um, I went, this is like about a year after I finished the Murrow School and uh, the Tibetans were starting a radio station. So uh, I asked some friends of mine for a bunch of equipment, got on a plane, went over and spent six months in Northern India with um, working for the uh, Tibetan Children's Village uh, which is the Dalai Lama's sister's school, very high-ranked uh, school in India. And uh, we did a radio show. We, we cranked out a bunch of Tibetan classic music. And then at noontime, we would put on a show called Dharam Salad. And that would mean anything of cultural value that we found around town. And what this is, is on Friday nights, this picture right here, this is me going from my hotel up a mile up some really rugged terrain to get to a place called Nick's Italian Kitchen. And in this uh, bag right here, I've got a bunch of mics. I've got a bearing eight channel soundboard. In my backpack here, I've got a laptop. Uh, my guitar is sitting there because we were doing an open mic. We record the open mic and play it uh, the next day at noon for our show called Darren Salad. You'll also notice I'm in a wheelchair. I'm a paraplegic, we'll get to that. Um, you'll also note, notice down here, my wheel is missing, which is a frequent uh, uh, occurrence when traveling in really low resource environments. So obviously this is a serpentine path. Like I say, I'm gonna do a little bit of Grandpa Simpson here, show you how this all got started. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which looked nothing like this at the time. Although I did work in this big building, I waited tables there up until I was about 22 years old. Um, my claim to fame from Wisconsin is I was the state diving champion. Uh, that gave me a scholarship to the University of Illinois. I dove in the Big Ten for uh, four years and met just the most amazing people, my teammates that are still my teammates today. I just love them to death. One of them, a woman named Robin Duffy, she was a multiple All-American. She uh, had started doing a thing called professional diving, which is, it wasn't new, but we didn't know anything about it. And I was like, God, how do you do that? And she goes, well, there's two things. Normally you just have to do the regular dives, springboard dives we're doing. And then she's like, there's two things that there's a catch. One of them is that you have to dive from very high height. So I don't know if you can picture this right here. We've got a three meter springboard. There's a five meter tower. There's a 10 meter tower. That's the Olympic height. Up around here is 20. I'm up here around 27, 28 meters. And if you can tell, I'm, I'm doing a handstand, which became my, my trademark dive. Um, the other thing you have to do, which I don't know if we can see this here, but uh, you have to light yourself on fire. So uh, this is a stunt trick that professional divers have been doing years. So she's like, if you can go up to the top and do a trick off the top of that ladder and light yourself on fire, you'll get picked up by a professional diving troop, which I did. I've got a couple quick videos here. Uh, this is in Roost, Germany. Um, very lucky. I have very few of these videos um, because we just weren't traveling around with cameras back then. 
Uh, this is the high dive. This is what a, a dive I invented called the Mifflin Street Dive was copied all over the world. Um, so we'll just uh, show you what it looks like to dive off of a 70 foot ladder. So with these shows, we do them at amusement parks, um, dolphin ariums. Sometimes we'd be at a beachfront, something like that. And there you can see it's way up in the air. And if you want to Google uh, Mifflin Street Dive, I've got a whole video, about a 13 minute video about the creation of this dive, which is kind of a funny story. A lean and a flip. So there you go. There's a Mifflin Street dive. The other thing we had to do was um, light ourselves on fire. This is not actually on, on this still right here. You can see that's me climbing the ladder. Uh, the person on top is my teammate, Jennifer Kelly. She was my teammate in college at the University of Illinois. And then she came and dove with me in France for three years. Um, we were in Germany and Jennifer's really small, really petite. And uh, she had the, when you do these fire dives, you get, you uh, put on welding gloves to keep your, to protect your hands. You also need it to kit start the fire, to, to use a flint. Um, she couldn't get it to work. And I was backstage watching her struggle. And I was like, all right, Jen, I'm going to come help you out. There we go. And there you see. Very small crowd. But there you can see that's what a fire dive looks like. Um, incidentally, Jennifer, uh, I mean, we were doing carny work, right? Jennifer graduated from the University of Illinois, dove with us for a little bit in France, got accepted into a PhD program in chemistry at UCLA, and now is Dr. Jennifer Kelly. So we'd get people that literally flunked out of uh, high school and people that had PhDs. Question is, why would you do this? I have a perfectly good college degree. Um, why in the world would you go and join the carnival? And the answer is this. So this is my traveling map for uh, seven years uh, after I got out of school. And uh, it, was just, it was just an incredible way to live and they paid for everything. So uh, my first uh, foray was down here in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Then I moved to uh, uh, Holland, worked in Holland for a while, down here in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, back up to Germany. And by that time I'd been traveling for about two years straight and I was sick of it. And I'm like, nope, I'm done. I'm going to go uh, go back to Wisconsin. I was out, accepted into a master's program uh, to teach. And uh, my bosses were like, how about one more job? Just one more job. And it was in France. And I was like, well, if it's through Paris, I don't want to do it because it's big city. And I'd been to Paris a bunch of times. I was like, no. Nope. And they're like, no, nope, this one's in the Alps. And I took one look at the uh, at the map. And it was right on the foothills of the Alps in a town that was so small, it wasn't even on the map. And I was like, that works. That's going to be a, a place for me. I showed up there and I spent my next four years there. Fell in love with the place. Um, I basically flunked my last semester of French in college. And uh, after, you know, four years in France, also I, I was fluent in French. Um, so it was really just a, an incredible experience. Every day, walking out your door when you're living abroad is a new adventure. And it just uh, gave me a passion for travel. Uh, not so much travel, but to go and stop and stay in one spot and learn how these cultures work. And it's a passion I got out of college and I've never stopped. Um, after my, after about seven years of doing this, it was time to actually go home and, you know, you can't do this forever. The, the high diving takes a toll on your body. And I'm like, where do I go? Um, I was with my uh, partner at the time, Rachel, and we thought that our favorite places were the French Alps and New Zealand. So we had to look for a place in America that was like that. 
and we decided on Portland, Oregon. And so uh, we're both from the Midwest and we just decided this is about as beautiful a place as we're going to find in the U.S. and we're still here. Um, and the other thing is I just became, uh, I was a, became a cyclist and Oregon just was to me the greatest place in the world to ride. Uh, very, not soon after, but about a year and a half after moving to Portland, I got a job working with Adidas. Um, became an event manager, got to work at some of the biggest events in the world, the World Cup, um, Final Four, Boston Marathon, these really big events. They would send me out and build a, you know, some kind of a kiosk to sell stuff at, and then we just sell and we had to deal with the athletes and things like that. Really great job. Then in 1996, I had my bike accident. Um, like I say, I had become a cycling addict. So while I was living in France, I uh, it was in the French Alps. These were all the best uh, the best riding in the world is in the French Alps. That's why they have the, the Tour de France is there. Um, I was living in the same roads where they ride the Tour de France. And so I stopped training diving because I wasn't getting that much better. I was good enough to do my job. And then I just became a cycling addict. And like I say, when the, one of the reasons we picked Portland was because the terrain was so diverse and I just fell in love with it. Got into this bike accident and uh, I cracked into a truck. This was in September of 1996. And uh, I uh, got hauled off to the hospital and uh, the doctors right away were, were like, you're not gonna walk. And uh, they're like, is there anyone you want to call? And I was like, there is someone I need to call. And it is, believe it or not, this lunatic. And uh, it's funny, but this, this is my brother, Dr. Andy Haig. We have fun because we do these presentations and he always puts a goofy picture of me. So I'm returning the favor and putting a goofy picture of him up there. He has better choice because I was a circus clown for seven years. He's got much better goofy pictures. Um, so very nice to have a doctor in the family, right? More serendipitous than that. Andy now is the is professor emeritus of the University of Michigan for while at the time I broke my back, Andy was the director of the University of Michigan Spine Center. My brother was a global expert in exactly what happened to me, which is, you know, serendipitous. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's fortunate, but you're like, We'd rather not have this happen, but once it did happen, it's like, oh my God, this is uh, this is pretty amazing. He is the, or has been, changes all the time, the North American representative for the International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine. Uh, I became their webmaster for quite a few years there. And he is the founding president of the International Rehabilitation Forum, which is an organization that we both found together. Um, so the International Rehabilitation Forum, this is a picture from our first uh, conference in uh, Kayseri, uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, if you knew anything about rehab medicine, you would notice here, this is basically a hall of fame of, uh, of rehab physicians that work in low resource countries. So the IRF takes rehab medicine and puts it in the poorest regions in the world. And rehab medicine, uh, people, it's physiatry. So this is the doctor you go to to avoid surgery. Um, it's also the doctor you would go to post-surgery to uh, put you through your rehab, things like that. Um, these doctors, there's a big organization called the ISPRM. They've got thousands and thousands of doctors. We wanted to do an organization that was just going to work in the, the old term is third world countries, but the current terminology right now is low resource environments. So these are, you know, countries that probably have like one doctor per three counties, something like this. Um, they just the most dedicated group of people I've ever seen. And uh, they will come back into the story very quickly. Um, after I broke my back, I returned to Adidas, and they hired me back to write their newspaper. When I was a, as a high diver, uh, when I traveled, I was uh, a diarist. I have pages and pages of journals. I probably got about seven or eight inches thick of, of journal entries. 
And um, when I got there, what, when a man, uh, Jay Edwards, he's a shoe industry icon, uh, he became my mentor. And he had this newspaper that he ran out of Adidas. And he would uh, ask me if I wanted to go write articles. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, actually won a contest. They had a, a company-wide contest to write a, uh, an article on the Boston Marathon. So I wrote it and I won it. And then Jay started sending me out to all these events writing um, articles for it. After I broke my back, the paper, which was just a, Adidas was a very small company at, uh, back in the early 90s. Um, the company grew to the point where they could hire a full-time person to work the newspaper. And so Jay hired me. And uh, so it was this great job. Um, I was traveling about once, once a month or something to an event, right up the event. I also learned how to do all the layout. Um, we also, uh, department grew. This is when the internet was just starting. We developed the first Adidas intranet. Um, it was just, you know, it was just a fantastic job. We did such a good job with this paper that the, uh, the head office in Germany was super jealous of us because everyone would read every, se every sentence that we wrote. And they put out a newspaper and it was just bland and it was just like group shots and saying, you know, the footwear department had a picnic and that was their paper. Whereas our stuff, we would call, we would interview, we, we were journalists. We would go in and do hardcore corporate journalism. Um, got to be pretty, pretty good at this. And this is right in the dot-com era, things were blowing up. And like a fool, I decided to start off on my own. So I left Adidas um, because at that point I could, I was very good at HTML. I could do print jobs, stuff like this. I was a copywriter and I went for about seven years on my own, uh, very unsuccessful, total hand to mouth living. My dad uh, came up to me one day and was like, you know, this is not working. What do you want to do? And I was like, you know, actually, I'd kind of like to be a journalist. That's what I like doing at Adidas. And he's like, let's go see if we can do that. So uh, I started looking for schools and came across, look at that, Coleman, Washington. Actually, I went to a sports bar with a friend of mine to watch football at the end of, um, this was like in November of 19, or pardon me, where are we at, 2006, and ran into a basketball player from Pullman and uh, started talking to the guy and he was like, you know where you need to go if you're looking at journalism is you need to go to the Murrow College in Pullman. And I was like, the what college where? And I kind of heard of Pullman, but I never paid any attention to, I knew of Washington State, but it just never registered. And uh, he whipped up my laptop and he goes, check this place out. And it was like, wow, that's really, that's amazing. That's super interesting. Um, it's out of state. It's going to be super expensive. I don't know if, uh, you know, he can afford that. And he's like, well, just send him a letter, see, you know, see what happens. Ended up applying to the Murrow School, got accepted. Now I had to find money. My dad, he wasn't expecting out-of-state tuition, but he's like, let's get you there and we'll start you going. But I was like, there's got to be some scholarships. I'm in a wheelchair. There's got to be some scholarships. I came upon this group, which is called Swim with Mike. And uh, Swim with Mike is uh, a group of ex-swimmer, well, some are still swimming, but ex-swimmers from University of Southern California, from USC. Uh, their big name is John Neighbor, multiple Olympic gold medalist. And uh, Mike is this guy named Mike Orr who broke his back um, in a motorcycle accident. And he was, a, he was a national champ on their relay. And so he was in a wheelchair. This is back in the 70s. And the team got together, did a swim-a-thon, raised money, and uh, got Mike through school. And then Mike felt guilty about having his, his teammates do this. So he's like, let's do more swim -a -thons. It caught fire, it got huge. They started getting celebrities like Will Ferrell and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to do this. Now it's this huge foundation. I think right now they've got 25 uh, wheelchair athletes in schools all around the country. They paid a uh, full scholarship for, um, for me to go to Wazoo and uh, never look back. Where are we going? There, oh, I jumped. Okay. Um, so I went to the Murrow School. I, hopefully you guys all know who that is right there. That's Glenn Johnson. Glenn took me under his wing. Uh, you know, it's really funny. Glenn and I are two very different people. I'm a, you know, I'm a 
liberal hippie guitar playing guy and Glenn is a conservative pastor, a conservative, uh, you know, deacon in his church and stuff, um, could not have come from two more different diverse uh, places in, in America. And we got along just absolutely fantastic. And it was just a sense of Glenn was like, here's what you got to do, do it. I don't care, you know, uh, what you think. Let's just do this. Let's make sure it's fair. Let's make sure we're showing both sides of the, of the equation when we report. And uh, we got along great. Glenn eventually hired me as his teaching assistant. Um, and uh, we had just a really successful uh, partnership. And I, I just love the guy to death. The most important thing I got out of the most important class I took was not a class at the Murrow School. It was this uh, show we did called After Hours. And um, so this was, I don't know what's happening during COVID, but Cable 8, you know, needs content. And so um, this show After Hours was sketch comedy. And uh, I remember try, you had to audition for it. And there were about 60 people that would audition for this sketch comedy show. And uh, there were four editors or whatever from the year semester before. I was very nervous to enter to audition for this. And uh, ends up that uh, they just, you know, they they would take on like 15 people. By the end of the semester, there were four people working on the show because they just didn't have enough ideas and people just dropped out. But the four people who were working on it, we had to do everything. And from everything from, you know, writing sketches to filming sketches to editing thing things and the most important lesson i got from after hours was that if you can think it you have to do it um you can't just be like well i we don't have the equipment we don't have the editing capacity it was like nope if you can think of it we're gonna find a way to do it and this uh mentality pushed me to the far edges of the planet earth and i graduated so um, this mentality of if you can think it, you have to do it. I was that combined with uh, my interactions with the International Rehabilitation Forum gave me the idea that I want to go to the clinics of these doctors and film them. I want to take to do document documentary films of clinics all over wherever I had connections with these doctors. And I'm like, how am I going to do it? And it's I'm like, this is going to be too expensive because I'm going to have to you know if I want to do this properly. I'm going to have to go like fly to these countries. That's going to take money. I'm going to have to hire a film crew, sound. And I'm like this. So I came up with this budget for this first trip. It was like $120,000. We pitched it all over the place. Uh, no one was going to buy on it. And then I'm like, wait, let's use the after hours mentality. If I can think it, I can do it. So I'm like, what do I need? I need camera, sound, uh, editing facility. And I'm like, I can do that all myself. So I put together this guerrilla video production kit. First thing, obviously, is cameras. Instead of having these, you know, some super nice camera, I went out and got two of these uh, just Sony camcorders. And, you know, so when, when my first trip was like 2013, 2014, um, in good light, these cameras are great, right? Um, with bad light, they're not so good. So then I had, to, I had to learn that. I'm like, if I shoot at night, I, I have to have super great light or it's not going to work. You'll also see under here, this is what is called a gorilla tripod that will hook onto anything. I have used this on every single shot I've ever done. Every single shoot I've ever done, I've, used, I've had a camera up on this gorilla tripod because you can hook it onto the back of a chair. Um, I could stick it on my knee so I could be my own like kind of GoPro guy or whatever. Um, I found out on my first trip around that sound was a big problem because these camcorders have really cruddy sound. They've got these condenser mics that pick up everything from goats to cars going by to airplanes. And when you're shooting in these countries, you get all this stuff. And I was kind of embarrassed. I was, um, I was interviewing the Minister of Health in Albania. And all I was hearing behind me was just cars and stuff. It was a very important interview for the uh, documentary I was shooting. And the sound was just for crap. So the next time I went out, I went and invested. It's only a hundred bucks and it's a zoom recorder and um, put a little leash on it, put it over someone's neck. I could hide it somewhere. And the sound quality for my products just got immeasurably great. Just an absolute spaghetti bowl of, uh, you know, sound cards of uh, data cards, headphones, 
chargers, you know, anything you can think of all these other, um, you know, conversion tools to get things to plug into different wall sockets all around the world. Um, and it wasn't enough just to have these things. I had to be able to, I, I could not lose any of these things, which is very hard when you're, you know, running around in dirt and mud and stuff like that. So I'd be very careful about where I stored these things because one little chink in the armor can mean that your whole shot for that day is screwed. So I'd be very, very careful of where I put these things. Um, this is a step down or a step up charger, depending on what you're, where you're stepping up or stepping down. And this will convert things from a 110 to a 220 or the opposite, really heavy chunk. It's just, it's just heavy as a brick. Um, luckily right now, I don't, Need my last trip, I never even used this. Um, every trip before, I used it all the time. And um, it also acts as a surge protector. In a lot of these countries I've been to, uh, the power will go out for several hours a day. And uh, when it comes back on, it doesn't just, the lights don't flash on. Especially in India, a huge flush of power will come and it'll blow the doors out of your average surge protector. And I lost uh, my first laptop I lost in India because I just had it plugged in through one of these things, had it plugged into the wall and a big, huge surge came in. The power had been out for like four or five hours, which is common. That happened about almost every day in, in Dharamsala. And uh, so the surge came and it just bam, blew this thing to pieces, fried out my laptop, which meant I learned that I cannot keep stuff plugged into the wall in a country where the power is, is infrequent. But uh, now, most of the products, like the camcorders, the, the laptops and stuff, you can plug them right into 220. I still, I wait till they charge up and I unplug them because I'm just paranoid about them blowing up. Uh, Glenn Johnson, rule number one, how do you become, what, what's the difference between an amateur journalist and a professional journalist? The tripod, right? And it's, it's absolutely makes sense. If you see someone with a bunch of handheld move, you know, junk moving around, your, your stuff looks like crap. And all you have to do, stick it on a tripod and lo and behold, learn how to you know, shoot a camera at a, at a subject and uh, you're a professional journalist or you know, whatever. You, you, it's a big step. It separates the amateurs from the pros. Uh, I had a different model of this that I had for about six years. I actually left it in Africa with my kids. Um, but this one, it was small, very convenient, extremely sturdy which is hard because for, uh, you know, low, low end tripods, they all fall apart. I've got a horrible story about one falling apart, but this one is super sturdy and I used it for years and years and years and uh, left it in Africa. Uh, late to the uh, production kit was a cell phone. Um, I always had a backup, a little tiny point and shoot um, that shot video, bad video, but in the places I'm shooting, people aren't interested in seeing high quality video. They're interested in, in the story that I'm shooting. Um, now cell phone is a regular part of what I shoot with. Um, the only, I mean, now, and now cell phones are, cell phones are better than these camcorders right now. Um, they're shooting, you know, full length Hollywood films on cell phones right now. The only restriction with these things is you have to make sure you've got enough uh, space. You've got enough data open on, and I made the mistake uh, in Senegal um, doing a three camera shoot, use my cell phone for the, uh, the center two shot. And, uh, about 10 minutes in, my cell phone starts beeping and it's like, you don't have any more space. And I'm like, oh my God. So it, it was really embarrassing because it was this really high ranking surgeon at a leprosy hospital. And I had to say, excuse me, time out. I had to dump all the, you know, the data onto my laptop, reset up the shoot. Luckily he was very patient, but it's not something you want to do. So the cell phones are great, but if you're using your, never, your regular everyday cell phone and you take a lot of pictures, which, which I'm always taking pictures with my cell phone, you have to make sure you have some data space. Um, obviously a laptop, like I say, I fried two laptops by having them plugged into uh, to sketchy electrical uh, boxes. Um, the other thing is the, so you wanna use a good gaming laptop because you're editing video. So you've gotta be able to edit all the time. Um, and you're gonna want, when you edit, you're gonna have a browser window open. You probably have a graphics program or you know Photoshop. Um, I keep my quark open because it's got cleaner, um, cleaner fonts on, on the print thing. So you're gonna, have, you're gonna have to be something, have something that can haul a lot of, uh, a lot of open apps. Um, 
Luckily, these boxes are much lighter than they used to be. My, the first couple of these, two of these I got were very heavy. Um, and, oh my God, hauling that stuff around was, was just really, really obnoxious. The latest computer I have right now is very lightweight Acer. It's as fast and has as much data storage as I'll ever need. Um, and it's cheaper too, my God. It's only like six, 700 bucks. This is the most, by far, the most important part of my gear. And this is a leather bag that I picked up in Salem at a uh, off-brand leather place, whatever. Um, I bucked up for it. I think I paid 250 bucks for this bag. The reason why I did is that cloth bag that you saw in the very first picture, um, I bought that in Dharamsala. And I'm carrying my uh, Behringer soundboard with me. And it just ripped and the soundboard dumped all you know, on the ground, got wet, um, never was able to use the soundboard again. So I learned this lesson. The one thing you cannot skimp on is, uh, is your bag. So all of this gear fits into that bag. And like all these little uh, pieces, data cards, stuff like that, they all have a specific location in my bag. And I'm very anal retentive about putting everything back where it belongs. Because like I said, you can all of a sudden, uh, you know, your camera's going low. Where's my charger? Oh, I left it at home. Boom, your shoot is just completely screwed. So if you're going to do this, you know, going out and shooting, you have to make sure that you catalog all this stuff, have a backup, battery backups, things like that. Backing up is so important when you do this because you might be, which I have been several occasions, way out in the middle of Africa, way out in the middle of uh you know, someplace in Asia and your batteries died, you know, you know things like this. And you're, you just can't go to the store and pick up a new one. So you've got to make sure you're backed up, got to make sure you catalog and uh, place all your gear. Um, start going through a couple of the film shoots. The first time I ever took my, the, the we call it the brick, because I think it's so heavy. <laughs> the, the bag of all my equipment gets super heavy. First time I took the brick out was to Bangladesh. And this was for the second world conference of the International Rehabilitation Forum. And um, this was just a super inspirational meeting. There's uh, Bangladesh, most, of, most countries in this low resource category have zero or maybe three uh, PM&R doctors. Bangladesh has like 130. So they did a conference and they invited us in to share uh, the conference, the IRF. And uh, so flew into Bangladesh with all my gear and started shooting everything I could. Shot uh, all these presentations, um, went around town, shot tons of B-roll. I just had a camera with me all the time. This was about, I think the conference was uh, four days long. Um, and uh, just some of the most inspirational talks you've ever seen in your life. I'm shooting these all uh, very, ends up being a funny story. There was a huge riot the second to last day of the concert, a concert of the conference. And everybody was told that they had to stay in place. And we're like, oh my God, flew all the way to Bangladesh and our conference is being canceled. They, they shut down the streets. There were riots. Um, the only cars they allowed on the streets were um, police cars and ambulances. And uh, I mean, there were buses on fire, not far from our hotel and stuff. And so I'm looking at my brother and I'm like, well, that sucks. Cause you know, we both had some presentations left to do. And uh, the head of the conference, this great guy, Tazamuddin is the head of the uh, Bangladesh society. He's like, ah, oh, no problem. We'll send you an ambulance. <laughs> so uh, three of us from the IRF, the ambulance comes into our hotel and pulls us out of the hotel. And we take this ambulance through a riot scene over to the medical school and we delivered our papers that day or delivered our, our presentations. And it said, it, stuff like this happens. And the trick is one of these, you know, can we do it? Yes. The answer is always yes. And it was great that uh, Toslam had this idea of yes. He's like, of course, we're going to get you over there. Don't worry, you're going to present. Just amazing. The next place. Um, so I was from there, I actually moved to front back to France, where I lived before trying to get some uh, citizenship. I had so much uh, video shot from the Bangladesh shoot that it took me weeks and weeks sitting in France to uh, edit all the stuff. I did uh, one um, 25 minute piece on the conference, did one in English. And then just because I was living in France, I did the whole thing and dubbed it all in French. Um, took a long time. And then while I was in France, I was there for six months. 
um, I started shooting all sorts of stuff. So I, I would call them Rick Steves pieces. So I would um, did a piece on the town I lived in, uh, did a piece on the basketball uh, team in the town, did a piece on handicapped athletes. Uh, it's called Handy Sports Savoyard. I was on a ski uh, club. So I'd go and did a piece on the ski club. It was one of these, and again, like an after hours mentality. If an idea comes in my head, I'm going to shoot it. So I did that for six months in France. Halfway through, I had to leave um, for a week because they have Schengen regulation visa. The Schengen area is an area in, in Europe where uh, if you're a foreigner, you have to leave once every three months uh, to go to a non-Schengen country. Luckily, England is a non-Schengen country. My best friend lived in, Schengen, in, in England at the time in London. And uh, so called him up, said, I'm coming over. He's like, great. And we got this idea to shoot like a comedy piece um, of us going around to all these uh, iconic uh, landmarks in London and looking for something. And I won't go to the gist of it, but it ends up being every time I've thought of a new concept to shoot, when I go to the editing booth, I learn something. So it's always worth it. You get this idea in your head instead of going, oh, that's silly. Shoot it. Go ahead and shoot it. See what kind of, uh, you know, see what you get back see if you can cobble it into something. And this thing ended up being really funny. Um, and like I say, it took me hours and hours and hours to cobble together this like five, six minute comedy piece. And it was just super well worth it. And it paid off later on when I was doing serious pieces because things that I did for this comedy piece, now I had this in my head. I could use my software uh, super quickly instead of having to relearn everything. Um, from from this th place, uh, th this time in France, um, I, had s I had about two months to get from France to the next ISPRM conference, which was in Beijing. Um, so now I'm starting to go out and shoot clinics of these doctors. So I went to Albania, it was my first place. And this was a town of uh, the Med Medano del Gripa um, uh, Rehab Center in uh, Skoda, Albania, an Italian pm &R doctor named uh, Germano Pastelli set me up there. Uh, I flew, uh, yeah, flew from France to Albania via Istanbul, not the most direct route, and spent two weeks in uh, Albania shooting video of people in wheelchairs, of uh, uh, pm &R clinics, um, got to speak a couple times. The reason why I got invited to these places, it's not just because they want me to shoot video, they want their people in wheelchairs to see someone in a wheelchair actively working. So um, I don't just show up there and say, hey, how's it going? I'm Tom. I'm like, all right, we're going to shoot, organize a shoot, organize a schedule. Um, they gave me a translator who actually ended up being my production assistant. And she was fantastic because she obviously spoke Albanian. We got to interview, like I say, we got to interview the Minister of Health. We got to interview the mayor of Skoder. Um, interviewed all sorts of doctors, and then we went to these really remote locations uh, in the mountains of Albania to interview guys in wheelchairs. They weren't getting out of their houses. They were living in their houses, never getting out. So it was uh, it was kind of a tough emotional shoot, but it was it ended up being really great. And then finally, we went to Ghana, and Ghana was just amazing. Where Albania was not at all set up for disability community, Ghana was completely set. Not completely but very well set up for disability community. And uh, ended up spending a month in Ghana, shooting uh, all, all over the place. Went to the furthest north that we could. Um, shot uh, with this, the Ghanaian Society of the Physically Disabled. Went to several clinics and shot clinics. And in the end, cobbled together a half hour video that ended up being an award-winning uh, video. At the end of this trip, ended up in Beijing for the big international conference, the uh, ISPRM, International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine Conference, where I presented the Bangladesh video to a bunch of the doctors in, from Bangladesh that were at the conference. And it was really emotional because it was super well received. They, they had never had someone document their conference before. And uh, they all of us were kind of in tears when, at the end because it was a really crazy time with the riot and all this stuff. Um, also got to shoot uh, some of the doctors, like the doctor Pastelli uh, that set up the Albanian shoot was not in Albania. So I got to shoot his stand up in uh, Beijing, as well as my brother Andy, who had 
arranged the the, uh, the Ghanaian shoot, he was not in Ghana at that time. So I got to shoot him there. And then my favorite part of the Beijing shoot was uh, I fancy myself a musician and they have talent shows at these big conferences. And nor normally it's just get a bunch of doctors up there and they, you know, play some music. And I got up there, this was a huge conference and they had a bunch of money and they had this massive professional stage set up. They had um, some fairly famous uh, Chinese journalists as MCs. And I got up there and I got to play uh, Won't Get Fooled Again, uh, the Who song in the middle of the uh, Olympic Plaza in Beijing. And it was very funny because the Asian and African doctors, South America, they're just kind of bopping along to it. And all the Western doctors were looking at me going, I can't believe you're playing Won't Get Fooled Again in the middle of this communist country. Because the Who have never been allowed to play in China because they don't like them singing songs like that. Um, so uh, the Ghanaian video ended up being about 30 minutes long, was played on Ghanaian TV, which is really cool. Um, I applied for the, uh, this, this uh, video competition. CUGH is a consortium of universities for global health. They get submissions from all over the world. Uh, Washington State is one of these, is a member of this organization. Um, the video, the, the thing I shot was a half an hour long. The, what they want is they want a trailer. So they judge it on the trailer. So this is the five minute trailer I shot in, uh, in Ghana. National Rehabilitation Forum has come to Accra, Ghana. While in Ghana for three weeks, we're going to take a look at the current state of rehabilitation medicine, as well as look at disability awareness in some of the most remote regions of the country. Ghana is an English-speaking country of 24 million people, 80% of whom are very religious Christians. It's located in a lush tropical zone south of the Sahara Desert with nearly 400 miles of Atlantic Ocean coastline. It is roughly the same size and shape as Arizona. In the four million person metropolis of Accra, only the major arteries are paved. That leaves most neighborhood streets rugged and dusty in the dry season and flooded when it rains. I'm in a dent of one of the wealthier suburbs of Accra and it rained last night. And as you can see, it's flooded the entire neighborhood, which means that uh, I can't go even to the market, my internet cafe, I'm completely shut out. Public transportation is quite cheap in Adenta, with legions of minivans offering rides to the center of Accra for about a dollar. But even though I could get into one of these vans, the drivers refuse to stop for me. That means that the cost of getting a disabled person to work goes from one dollar in the van to twenty-five dollars in a taxi. But these concerns are not going unheard. In fact, just the opposite is occurring we were invited to attend a meeting of the Accra chapter of the Ghana Society for the Physically Disabled. As difficult as the streets are, people came from all over the capital using all kinds of mobility devices to attend the monthly meeting. The disability community in Ghana is extremely well organized, and in 2007, they were able to get the Ghanaian Disability Act passed into law. Well, I think there's a lot of improvement so the Federation have been able to work hard to get legislation that back their rights is the implementation we are self-forcing to, to, to effect. And we also have the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability ratified. We we'll work to get the uh, a percentage allocation of the District Assembly Common Fund for persons with disability. And we also work to get a person with disability as appointed as a national a substantive minister for the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Traditional Affairs. But most of Ghana's 24 million citizens live in rural areas with limited resources. To see the condition of the disabled in one of these remote regions, I traveled to the northern town of Garu, just a few kilometers from both the Burkina Faso and Togo borders. John Allo heads up the regional community-based rehabilitation team that offers medical, financial, and social support to Garu's disabled. Uh, the biggest challenge that I see will be um, how the community, including uh, government organs, will actually receive people with disabilities to be included in whatever is going on within the context of the environment. Because the Disability Act is in place already, Ghana is fortunate to have the Disability Act. But of course, 
it goes with uh, challenges. This implementation is not easy because there has to be uh, access to buildings, access to education, access to employment, access to transport, health, and what have you. Isaac Tuga is Garu's local CBR coordinator. He explains his organization's multidisciplinary approach. In the team, we have a physiotherapist who is looking at physical disability. We have a mental health uh, officer who is assessing mental health conditions. We have uh, an eye nurse who assesses impairments as regards to eye conditions. We also have an audiologist. The most inspirational story is that of a mother and her daughter who went from simple farmers to the most successful seamstresses in the region. My name is Tom. How are you? Fine. This is your shop, yeah? This is where you do your work. My because mother? of her impairment, mm -hmm. if you come with a dress for him to show for you, he will not be able to stand up and take the measurement with a tape measure. He's so not able looks... to take the measurement. But he's able to look at you and make an educated judgment. So in Garu, the most unlikely of places, a disability community thrives on hard work and ingenuity. We had a month to shoot that, and it was really, uh, you know, it was really inspirational thing. It was great. We won this big prize. Um, the next two projects were much longer. The next two projects, I spent five, six months in each country. So I'll let the video show you. The next place we went to is Nepal. We entered this in the contest and uh, we got Buckus, but it was much better, much better effort. In spring of 2015, two major earthquakes rocked Nepal, killing more than 10,000 and leaving 3 million homeless. My name is Tom Haig, and I'm a former professional athlete who is now a paraplegic and documentary filmmaker. I have the great honor of being friends with Dr. Raju Dakal a Nepalese physiatrist finishing his residency in PMNR in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Dakal asked me if we could support the Spinal Injury Rehabilitation Center in Kathmandu. We raised more than $5,000 for the clinic, but I thought I could do more. Dr. Dakal urged me to come to Nepal and work as a peer counselor so patients could see someone live a normal life with spinal cord injury. As a filmmaker, I don't lead a normal life but I was sure that seeing someone in a wheelchair make films would be even more interesting. In March of 2016, I flew to Nepal with a cell phone, two camcorders, three tripods, a computer, a microphone, and a spaghetti bowl of wires and data cards. My goal was to use video to ameliorate health care in the furthest reaches of the country. There are thousands of instructional videos on physical therapy, occupational therapy, and nursing but none of those videos are done in Nepalese. The department heads at the SIRC love the idea. They do service missions to the most remote areas of the country. With the increasingly fragile nature of Nepalese infrastructure, those missions would become fewer, slower, and more dangerous. But the videos could ensure that patients, therapists, and caretakers in remote regions would have an audio-visual textbook to work from. But there was one big problem. I was the only one who knew how to edit video, and I don't speak Nepalese. Then, a miracle happened in the form of Ronika Shrestra. I came to SRC with my dad for his rehab, and uh, there I met Tom. I just wanted to utilize my time at SRC, so I asked him if, if he could teach me some computer stuff. Uh, I saw him once editing the videos of SRC and asked him what it is. And I asked him if he could teach me some editing some videos. That's how we started editing the videos, and that's how I got involved in it. Veronica was just a, it was just a godsend because I really needed a translator, and I needed someone who could help edit video. And uh, Veronica obviously spoke her English was really great. 
I needed someone who was interested in learning the editing process. And she took to it just so quickly. Any little, little small thing she, she would fix. And she's very detail oriented. And uh, I'm, I'm just so lucky that I got to, uh, got to have her. In no time at all, Ronica not only mastered camera setup and editing software, she began directing all the film shoots. For 12 weeks, the SIRC became the studio lot for Hollywood Studios. At one point, we were producing nearly a film a day. Everyone from bus drivers to department heads, and of course the patients, became Hollywood movie stars. In the end, we produced 25 short films, all in Nepalese. Titles ranged from advanced wheelchair skills, to first responder spinal cord procedure, to hydrotherapy. But Hollywood Studios didn't end there. Word got out that we had a fully functional video team shooting disability films for free, and many local organizations asked us to help. On top of the SIRC videos, Hollywood also produced video for Asia Tri Disability Protest March, the National Disabled Persons Table Tennis Association, the Amrita Foundation for Mental Health, the Engage Empower Wheelchair Basketball League. It's not about disability, it's about discovering abilities, which is what this league does. And the Spinal Cord Injury Student Hostel. Namaste, Mari Siram Dakar, Mirgor Gurkha. After four months, Hollywood Studios closed up shop. But our films will continue to enhance the quality of life throughout the Nepalese disability community for years to come. So this, that was a really intense uh, six-month period, and I'm getting the whole time I was there. Um, and it gave me the idea that this producing video is one of the best vocational tools for people in wheelchairs because they got so excited. Their other vocational um, tools or opportunities suck. They'd be like knitting, crocheting, maybe the best ones do some computer soldering or something like that. This one, every time I pulled out the bus, people would be like crazy, what are we gonna shoot today? What are we gonna shoot today? And this gave me the inspiration to teach this, to do go around and teach video production to kids with disabilities. Friends in Senegal for, that I've known for about 20 years, and we set up a program at the Centre Talibou Dabo in Dakar, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest disability school in Senegal. And these are my guys. It was really kind of funny because um, I'd been playing, I'd, I tried, took about two years to set this up. And when I got there, the person I've been dealing with left. So the school, when I got there, they thought it was going to be a video appreciation class or something. <clears throat> so they got me students that really had, the, they had the highest level of disability of anybody in their school, in their, in the entire city of Dakar. So I had kids, um, only three of them spoke French. I was teaching this in French, only three of them spoke French. Um, I didn't have anyone who could type because they all had manual uh, dexterity issues. Um, and I'm like, oh my God, I, you know, I just came here for a six month project and I don't have anybody who can do it. Uh, eventually these guys just, they surprised me. It was unbelievable. They just, uh, they, once I showed them cameras, they, they got together and between like two or three of them, they could get a camera to work. They could get it on a tripod. A um, couple of them could get the edited, they had ma enough manual dexterity to edit video. Oh, that took a long time. This was, took a long, long process, about three months before I could actually get anyone to, to do things. Um, and then it was so great. This is like about three weeks before I left. Um, Mustafa, my great big student who's back here, Mustafa, I was also teaching um, grade schoolers like rudimentary computer skills, like Excel, stuff like that. I'm teaching these another class and he comes in and points at the brick and he's like can I take the brick I'm like sure man go take it <clears throat> so he goes and uh you know hour later I'm done with my class I'm like let's see what Mustafa did with the brick I go about you know two buildings down and he's got a full three camera shoot with sound and he's interviewing one of his teachers with almost everyone in this shot here helping out one way or another so the team got together and where I was expecting I was going to get each person to be able to do what, do these skills together as a team, they put it together. And it was kind of thing brought tears to your eyes. 
I also, while I was there, got involved with the Centre Hôpitalier de l'Ordre de Malte, which is Africa's biggest, um, West Africa's largest uh, leprosy rehabilitation center. Um, and I got in touch, oh, we were getting chopped with Abdou Nado down there on the left, and we're chopped off Michelle over there. But um, Abdou is, he's got leprosy in his spine, so he's got very limited disability, or a very massive disability. He's completely self-educated and he's brilliant and he's very well read. He became our voice piece for this, for this project at this hospital. And uh, so we shot, much like we did in Nepal, we shot 13 videos at the hospital, <clears throat> all of the leaders of the hospital um, tell, telling what they do. So we had surgeons, this is a guy who was literally no formal education, interviewing surgeons, interviewing pharmacists, interviewing chemists, and he would prep for it and get ready and just, it's just another case of, you know, give someone opportunity and they're gonna do it, which is what I think happened at the Murrow School. They gave me opportunity. I thought of these ideas and you can do it. Um, I guess I'll leave it there and I will uh, open up for questions. Great, Tom, we got a couple questions here. This one's from Emily. Um, what have the people that you've interviewed taught you about how to write and tell their stories? that if they're, if they're interested in the program, they are very interested. Um, they all have ideas. They've all got tons of, of ideas and concepts that they want to see come to fruition, <clears throat> whether it be with you know, the video production or uh, the state of disability in their country. Um, so I spent, these guys in Albania, I mean, they were, just, they were just housed. They were just sitting, a lot of these guys just sitting in their house you know, waiting for meals to come. And when they saw me running around with a camera, they're like, so you flew in from America and you're running around with a camera and they're, you know, they're like, I should do this. And I'm like, yes, you should. Absolutely. So it's, it throws ideas into their heads and it just ex expands their horizon to something fiercely. It just, and it's super rewarding, super emotional. Great, we have another question from Bradley. When you did dubbings, how would you find someone that spoke the language? Beg. I, I mean, this is, it's uh, basically I've got, when I'm going to one of these places, I've got a doctor who sent me there. And uh, in Ghana, I had, um, I was a physical therapist. Actually, she's got a her PhD in physical therapy right now, Gifty Ginyanti. And uh, so she would sit down with me and translate. In Nepal, uh, Raju Dakal, who is the only active uh, physiatrist in the country. Um, he's actually, I met him. I had all this stuff that I needed dubbed because uh, I needed the stuff, uh, English speaking stuff, and I needed it dubbed in Nepalese. And so we sat down in uh, Kuala Lumpur at another conference. And I was like, Raju. So I grabbed him for a whole afternoon. And I'm like, you have to dub all this English stuff into Nepalese. Um, so basically, the people that have invited me, by and large, are the people that are going to help me out with the dubbing. Um, in the, uh, the, the uh, Santo Talibu Dabo, I did it all myself because, I, like I say, I spent years and years in France, so I did that myself. You also get a lot of street cred traveling on, around the world with the second language, even if it's not their language. Just the fact that you have a second language gives you much more street cred than some American who's in there saying, do this, do this. So friends, friends help friends. Wonderful. Looks like we have time for one last question here, Tom. This question comes from Madison. How do you find out about work opportunities in these low resource environments? Um, so there's these, there's NGOs, non-government organizations. They are, there's thousands of them and uh, they're always looking for volunteer help. And so, which means that if, you know, if you're going to do it, they're not going to pay it for a while. <laughs> you're going to, uh, you're going to probably have to volunteer for them for a while. And uh, if you stick with them, they might give you a, a paid gig to do something. In my situation, um, we've got to raise all the money ourselves. So we do, um, I got to do public speaking, uh, GoFundMe page, uh, writing grants and stuff like that. Um, so if you can come up with the money yourself, an NGO, well, you can, you know, you can use them for, as a, um, as a, a tax-free basis. So we offer this to a couple people with the international rehabilitation form. If you have a project you need funded, you can use us for a tax-free basis. Then go raise the money, 
fund yourself and go. That's basically what I did with the uh, Nepalese project. It was like, I got to find the money. I found the money and go. So find an NGO that's going to sponsor you. And uh, if you've got a project, see if they go for it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tom. I'll go ahead and leave you with a couple seconds here to leave some closing remarks. Um, just, I'm super honored to be involved in the Murrow Symposium. And I went to three of them as a student and I, th I found them the most inspirational days of, of the entire time I was there. So to be invited to do this, uh, to be able to do it, it's a, it's a career highlight. Really, really can't thank you guys enough. And if you think of something, do it. Find a way to do it and just get it done.